if you want to do something and like, because I, I, I've, I've had that thought when I was younger. I used to think, I'll never be good at playing guitar. I've never played guitar. And look at how amazing some people are. But like, everyone sucks at everything when they're, when they start, you know? Then come out the pussy draw or Mozart. Draw and fucking Mozart, that's exactly right. You did not come out the pussy that way. Not talent. Yeah. People who throw around talent. But so it's, that's, that's what I don't like about the word talent. I think I've talked about this before. But I, to me, talent is a very defeatist concept. Really? Yeah. It's, to say that you have talent is like as if it was like given to you. Right. You know, as if it, it was like this this gift. Well, I think you can have like a predisposition. Sure. And, and, but like it still has to be developed. Yes. And that, yeah, that, that's what we're saying. Like put in the hard work. And if you feel like if you feel like no one believes in you, I fucking believe in you. There, I said it. So go out and do that shit that you want to do. Don't let life, life live you, you know? Like, you fucking be proactive and live your life. Because I, I think you only get one. It's such a sad waste when you, when you see people look back at an advanced age and be like, oh, I just, I should have done this or that. Like, just fucking do it now. What's, what's that saying? Mean... You're never as young as you are today? Oh, that makes sense. And so it's just it's how I've always lived my life. Just fucking, I want to do this thing, so I'm gonna do it. Yeah, and look what you've accomplished. I've watched you build more than one empire, which well, is crazy. How are you gonna accomplish anything if you don't do it? Yeah, and you're a good for nothing fucking high school dropout scumbag. Yeah, pretty much. It's it's amazing. That's uh, it's very inspiring. I think everyone's just afraid of what people are gonna think of them. Yeah, fuck other people. Fuck their opinions. But who gives a shit? Nothing ever happens unless you take the first step. Yeah. It's so obvious, but I think it's so easy to overlook the concept of, of like, the only way something's gonna happen is if you do it. I've had that thought so many times in my life. Well, like, you with, like, stuff that panned out and stuff that didn't pan out, where I'm like, man, if somebody walked in on me, like, the first day of, like, trying guitar or something. Oh, God, yeah. And they were just like, what are you doing? And I was just like, I don't know, I'm trying to learn to play guitar. And they'd be like, you yeah, know, you know, like, you'll I never could, be this. I could just imagine that scenario of, like, oh, okay, you know. Oh, it's happened to me. It's like, but Clapton had day one, you know, like, yeah. the, 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 everybody has the first day. That's another quote I like. The, the, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I think it's because we all have, like, that voice in our heads that tell us, like, we're not good enough and, like, we're, we're we, we suck and whatever. Uh, it shows up in a million ways. But, like, the, the, the voice of doubt in your mind. And then when someone else comes along, and says, and, and echoes that doubt, like, you'll never do it. Th then, then that voice in your head gets like twice as bit loud, you know, like, I told you, you know? Yeah. But fuck that voice. That voice isn't you. You gotta tell that motherfucker to go fuck itself. Yeah. yeah. like a like a wow we, we we actually made it kind of situation oh, you know yeah. as awesome as the last couple of years have been it it still felt surreal and it didn't feel because it was game grumps and because it was something that like you had built with john so much it didn't really feel like i deserved like a lot of the success that came with it if that makes sense it was like i didn't build this i just i jumped on you know, when there were already like a million subscribers and stuff. But I mean, Ninja Sex Party, like, that was something that like, Brian and I created out of nothing, you know? So like, 
for that to like have taken off felt amazing. And like, I think just because my dad was there in the audience and like he was beaming, you know, and my mom was there, it was just so fucking amazing. What was the point of all this? Um, oh, just that like, so there were a bunch of people asking me like, what's it feel like, you know? And like, can I ever get to that point? And like the short answer is yes, you can. And the other answer is like, you know, I had a lot of fucking help, you know? Yeah. Like I did not do this on my own and all that. Like my parents and my grandma. Granny Sex Bank gave me a check for like, let's just say a four digit number that was more money than I had at the bank at the time, you know? And that's what allowed me to do um, the Sacred Chalice mm. videos when we made those. Which led to us getting our first manager and all this shit. But like, I got to hang out with her the other day and I was like, I was like, you know you made all this possible and she was like, you made this possible. Like, it's just, it's just fucking, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with all this, other than that, like, this is the first time in my life I've ever felt, like, you know, really happy with career stuff, and, like, it just feels great. It feels great. I was in my 20s, um, I was kind of dealing with some mental stuff at the beginning of my 20s and then some physical problems, um, because I had issues with my back for a while. And also I didn't have much success with the bands that I was pursuing at that time. And a lot of my heroes, like Rush and Nirvana and all these other bands that I love, had already accomplished tremendous things by the time that they were 30. Unfortunately for Kurt Cobain, like he was already gone by that point, but he changed the history of music by the time he was like 25, you know? When I turned 30 and, and started Ninja Sex Party with Brian, like there was this feeling of, uh, I've got to catch up, you know, I'm behind. Which is of course ridiculous now, but it's certainly how I felt at the time. And, and that's part of the reason I've been like so insanely driven these past eight years. Just like never stop working, go, go, go. It's because I'm not, I'm not just trying to make a dream happen. I'm trying to make a dream happen to the point where I feel like I should be at the age that I am now, you know? Uh, not a couple of years ago. The upshot of all that is that it's a mixture of that fear-based, you know, thinking. And also the fact that because we're in YouTube, uh, we are at the mercy, our careers are at the mercy of other people. But, uh, it was like, it, there was also two things, like, one was about work, like I work all the time. Um, and I worked ridiculously too much in 2017. Yeah, we both did. We both we both hit the wall like two separate times yeah. in, in that year. And so coming out of working that hard was for for one in one case the way you put it was like didn't have any time to celebrate accomplishments. Right. And then two, um, sort of as a result of that, I didn't know how to relax or exist without work. So it was, it was sort of like this, this sense of like uselessness, like meaninglessness. Right. Um, because I didn't have something to like go into work to do. It was just kind of like, okay, now I have to exist for a month. And what do I do with that, you know? Right. Um, so that was tough. But I, I, I got through it. I got through it. Remember we were trying to name Starbomb? 
You're like, oh, oh yeah. my god, every band name is taken. Yeah, oh yeah. That was all you though, man. You, you picked that winner. It was interesting, that whole process. Because we, we threw out like hundreds of names. Yes. Oh yeah. And, Each. And that was the only one where all of us were like, yeah, yeah, it's cool. What was the one that we almost went with? It was a physics term. Oh, it was like the intensity project or something like that? The, the intensity frontier. The intensity frontier. Yeah, it's some kind of physics thing. Feel free to use that for your band if you want. Yeah. We, we just, we thought it was cool, but we just not like quite right for the Starbomb project. Well, the thing that was, the problem with it was what literally just happened, where I was like, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah it exactly. Was, it was at where we'd, we'd talk about it in person, and we'd be like, yeah, the, the intensity pro- it's project? It's yeah, pro- yeah, yeah, what is it? And it was, it was like, okay, well, if we can't remember it. Yeah, no one else will. We can't expect anyone else to. Um, That's so true. But Star, Star Bomb was awesome, because the, the, that's all that... A naming process is such a unique... Because you, you think like, oh, I came up with a name, that's it. But it's like, no, you gotta consider like, okay, then what does the logo look like? Okay, what is the SEO like? Yes. Is there anything else named Starbomb in the world? For anyone who doesn't know, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. Yeah. Which basically is a fancy way of saying, when you type the name into Google, how early will your thing come up? Yes. And if it ain't the first thing, you probably need to look for a new band name. Yeah, you're fucked. Yeah. Yeah, you, you really need something that stands out, which is where Ninja Sex Party came from, too. Yeah. We just needed something as different as possible. Ninja Sex Party is, is such an interesting name. It's a real double-edged sword. It is. And, yeah. it's, and it's, it's only a double-edged sword at, like, certain parts of your career. Yeah. Once people know it, then it's cool. But, like... When people are finding out about it and they think that it's some sort of pornography or they just don't know it's a comedy band like it just there's a lot of explaining to do well i think it's i think it's a bell curve that goes down and back up Mm. because i think at the beginning it sets you apart and then there's a curiosity there right when you're just 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 inverse bell yeah when you're like a tiny band just starting out it's like Ninja Sex Party, oh, that's funny, you know, like, I'll, yeah, I'll give you a chance, you know, like, yes. it, it, yes. it sort of lets you break that barrier a little bit. Yeah, the curiosity. And then when you get, like, to a certain place, I feel like then it works against you. Because it's like, okay, well, now you have sex in the name. Yes. And that's like a whole can of worms in yeah. terms of, like, you know, a, a YouTube algorithm or, like, uh, venues not- that'll host you. Mm-hmm. But then, when you're huge, you become known enough, it goes back up again because it's like you can't forget that fucking name. Right, right. For for all you young musicians out there, starting bands, like this is an important lesson. Like, definitely name it something that stands out. You want something that that is fun for people to tell their friends about. Part of the appeal. I believe, and I mean I could be wrong about this, I always thought part of the appeal to NSP was that like, it's fun to talk about. If you have a sense of humor like my friends and I do, I would love to be like, yeah, so there's this band out there and they sing songs about dinosaurs and dicks or whatever, and it's a Jewish superhero and his ninja friend who doesn't say anything but occasionally kills people. That's fun. Same thing with uh, Ghost. Part of the reason I think they've been so successful is because it's fun to talk about them. You're like, yeah, so it's this satanic pope, and they, you know, they they have these concerts that are like these giant, crazy devil churches, but I mean, it, they don't actually believe in that. It's all theater. Um, but it's, it's interesting, it's different, it really stands out. Some people are totally against that sort of thing. They're like, listen, I'm gonna be judged on the merits of my music and image be damned. And uh, I respect that too. But man, it just makes it so much harder to get things started, you know? I 
certainly respect it, but I don't believe it. Yeah, I, I, it's like you got to be realistic. Like, especially if you have goals, right? Like, if it's like, if you just want to write music and put it out there and you call it what you want, like, fine. No, totally. But if you're like, and also I want to be able to pay my bills with this, it's like, okay, well, yeah, you have the to game. You have to position yourself in a certain way. People are like, I just want to do it all on my own, you know? It doesn't work like that, though. Like, that's not how yeah. the world works. I wish it did. Like, um, if you, you need help, like, everybody's had help. Yeah. Because that's how we were with Sky Hill. Like, when Pete and I started Sky Hill, like, we didn't want to put our faces on anything. We just wanted to be in the background. We didn't want to be, like, out there. That's why on that first album, like, there's no imagery of us. We just wanted to let the music speak for itself. Yeah. Um, which is fine. Yeah. And but you we sold be, maybe 10 albums. Yeah, exactly. You have to be willing to, okay, well, that means yeah. that it's going to be a lot fucking harder. Yeah, totally. And you can't be frustrated when people don't connect with it because it's, you know, it's so intangible. Yeah. I'll get, like, a lot of young musicians asking, you know, what the best way to get their stuff out there is. And it, it's, I just don't know. Like... Oh, yeah, it's so different now. Yeah, well, it's it'll just never be the same story twice. I, yeah. I, I feel like I've certainly talked about this on the show. Yes, absolutely. I have the same experience. People are like, how do I get into voice acting? Or I was like, fuck if I know, man. man. Become a YouTuber? Start like, a video game show, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've described it this way before. It, it's like a fog, you know, trying to find your audience. And you have to just kind of like push the fog out of the way and do all these different things. In addition to like working on your craft as hard as you can relentlessly every day, you know, for years. That's crucial. You can't, there's no shortcut for that. But like, you just want to like do all the things in your favor that you can and that will like wave some of the fog out of the way. And then when the fog separates, you walk through it and you get to that next level. And then you figure out how to push that fog out of the way. But the thing is, like, for, for me, that was joining Maker, you know, and moving out to L.A. and, like, getting into the YouTube world, like, where, in a place where it was centralized. But Maker doesn't exist anymore. And, like, Let's Plays were much fewer and farther between in 2013 when you asked me to join the show. So, like, it was a different, different kind of world. So, like, what I'm saying is, like, that fog, as you push your way through, even after you get through it, the fog closes up behind you. So like no one else can take that exact path. And that's a tough thing to describe to people because like it's just so, it feels so unfair to, to say that to someone who like is, is hopeful that there is one answer, you know? I feel like it could be generalized, generalized a little bit. Like consider, the, the thing that I, is is always um, frustrating to see like young artists experience is this sense of like you say when, when it's like I just want the music to speak for itself it's like okay well consider what that is right like if you're just working on your craft you're becoming a better musician like and, and that's it right like you will make good music because you're doing that but that does not equate to you know, being popular or selling albums or, you know, uh, being respected by, like, other musicians. Like, those are different things. Correct. Everything I just said is only in relation to making a living at yes. what you love to do. Um, Not just, work, like, making great art. Because you, you, that's within your power at any point. Yeah, and that's, and that's sort of what I'm saying, too, is, like, okay, so you say, you know, you went to, you moved to L.A. and you went to Maker and all that stuff and worked there, and it's like, but that was, consider like what that was, that was giving you proximity to people who could make a difference in your career and meeting people who were sort of in the same world as you or get you connected to people who are in the same world as you. Yes. Like that's, you can generalize that as like networking and proximity. Oh, sure. To you, it's like, oh, I moved to LA and I worked at Maker or whatever, but it's like, in the general sense, it's like, okay, focused on networking right. for a bit and, and committed to making it easier for uh, my band to have visibility and for me to have frequent collaborators. Yep. 
Do you want to know the best advice I ever got with all that? Because networking was something I was terrible at. Because it felt gross. When you're networking, quote unquote, come from a place of generosity. Put it in, in your head mentally like, I have something to share. Like certainly work hard at what you're doing and so you can be really proud of it. So you can approach someone actually feeling like, hey, I'm, I have something to give you that you'll really enjoy. Because if in your head, like you feel that they don't have anything to gain by speaking to me, I can only gain something by them. You'll feel gross and you'll be nervous when you talk to them. And like people can like feel that immediately. Mm. The, the way it was taught to me was uh, networking is farming, not hunting. Like you're just, you're just planting seeds, man. You're just going out there and being like, hey, you know, like this is an important thing to me. Maybe you'll enjoy it as well. As opposed to like, please give me something, you know? Because people know when they're being hunted. And, and no one likes it. No one likes that feeling. Like, we, we know that feeling very well. So, figuring out how you can come from a place of generosity is one of the best networking tips I ever received. And it really, really changed my perspective and helped me do it, you know? Because you gotta do it. Yeah, that's a, that's a much kinder way to put how I've always viewed it. Is uh, just that, like, in, in the same sense of like when you approach somebody that's important and it's like, oh, yeah, they're gonna do so much for me. It's like, no, I'm, I'm awesome. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's. it's I have it's, something to offer. It's cool for them to meet me too. Like, yeah. I'm not a fucking bump on the log. And sometimes it's hard to be in that mindset. Right. Because it's like, I don't know. Sometimes you can just be so down and out, or like so desperate, or whatever. And sometimes the person's just like, no, fuck you, get away from me. Yeah, and, but, and like, no matter what. But then it's like, all right, fucking right on, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, seeing it from the other side now, like, there, there's plenty of times where people will approach me and be like, I know you're busy and you don't want to hear this and whatever. But, like, there have been tons of times where people will send me their band and I'm like, this is awesome. Well, I'll also say that, for me, that's a surefire way to get me to not... If you're, if you're setting yourself up for failure, I'm like, all right, fine. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm, I'm busy and I don't have a lot of time for myself even. So if you're saying, like, if you don't isn't that you're great, great, then yeah. fucking, you're not that great. That's so, understandable, yeah. Um, which seems cruel, but also, like, it's, it's a little liberating when you realize it from that perspective because you should be selling yourself if you're trying to. Yeah, like, if, if, if you think this is what you want to do for the rest of your life, like, you better be good at it. <laughs> like, and you better know that you're good at it. Like, if a fucking sales, you know, like an old timey salesman showed up at your door and was like, hey man, I got this thing, it's not that great. Yeah. Just be like, then I don't fucking want to buy it, Yeah, dude. why'd you knock on my door? <laughs>
enough to say. I just like boys and I like watching cartoons. So I was like, oh man, I'll do something that has to do with that. Yeah. I liked video games. I don't think I ever thought of like, I guess I thought about being an animator. Uh, the only like career, yeah, voice actor was the first thing, I think, when it comes to career stuff. I think when you when, when I first met you, you were like, this is what I really, like I'm animating right now, but voice hacking is what I really want to do. Well, it's definitely fun. I've been doing it a lot more. Yeah. I, I super enjoy it. I, in fact, I think you actually said to me that animating was more or less a vehicle so you could voice act. Well, that's how it started, sure. I wanted to do more voices, so I started animating because nobody was asking me at the time and I really wanted to voice act for stuff. Right. So I was like, well, I'll just make my own shit to voice act then. It's just fun. I don't know. It's really fun. You get to meet fun people. I just like it a lot. Me too. I like the real acting too, but um, voice acting. Yeah, the real acting just locks you into hanging out with an awesome group of people, but the same people over and over. Well, that was um, that was something that uh, Harry Partridge said to me once. He was like, he had shot something in, in uh, a short, and he was like, oh man, you know, uh, filming stuff, he's an animator. He was like, filming stuff is, is way more interesting than animating, because you have stories. And it's like, oh man, the thing, the thing, the day that the thing went wrong, or like, the thing, the guy came up and was like, what are you doing? There's all kinds of shit that happens, because there's, you're in a place, and there's other people around. But in animation, or like voice acting or something, you're just like, oh man, I remember that time I sat down for 10 hours, and got up, Pizza. Yep. <laughs> yep. When you, when you become uh, introduced to an audience that's so big and so diverse, you learn what makes people tick in general on a level that you could have never imagined before, you know? Before that, there's probably about a hundred people in your life who, you know, maybe one person uh, likes this one thing or gets upset by this other thing or is into this type of movie or whatever. But when you start getting exposed to the opinions and feelings and uh, likes and dislikes of millions of people, then it really, like, it changes how you see the world, really. What was the question specifically as a creator and business person? Yeah, what are the unexpected skills you learned uh, as part of being entertainers and business? Yeah, sorry, I didn't answer that right, but basically just learning how to deal with a hundred different types of people that I never would have encountered in my normal life. Empathy. Yeah. I guess. I, I, as an independent creator, it, it was probably a little more selfish. And then building a team, I had to be a lot more empathetic and understanding. So that probably. <laughs> it's so easy to be that person, right? Like that piece of talent that's like. Well, I'm the talent, so what I say goes, you know, like, it, it's so easy to be that. And then, you know, whether or not that's the way that art gets made the right way or not is open for debate. I just feel like business is people, and if you want to work with people, they work better when they're happy and feel like they're understood and, and appreciated. I basically said the same thing in 8,000 words, and you just said empathy, and I was like, fuck. <laughs> That's fine though. So you've got to work through to find the, what the big word means. Truth. Every word is one word, but has a definition that's many words. Many words. It's not as if YouTube tells anyone, really, any creator that we're aware of, uh, what the algorithm is. They just kind of change it in private um, based on whatever they're doing internally. And then we, we 
sort of have to figure it out based on trends we see in views and things like that. But we actually don't know when they change it or what they change it to. It's kind of a roll of the dice. Everything that you have never liked that we've changed, it was because of the other. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Thumbnails, naming conventions. Types of things we play. Release schedules. Yeah. It's, it's all because of the algorithm. Yeah, it's just trying to stay afloat in waters that change with the weather. You know? like, what, what small changes can we do that don't change the show at all that will help our standing in the algorithm a little better? It's usually stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like marginal, marginal changes. Yeah, it, the, the algorithm, you know, it becomes this phrase that people hear and but, but the, the algorithm, you, you can basically equate that phrase to way to survive, you know, or way to make a living, um, or continue to make a living. So it, it's, it's, it's something that like, we don't really know about or really understand fully, but we're, we're just kind of doing our best, as are all YouTube creators. Yeah, I feel like the only way to handle it and how you guys just handle it and how everyone handles it is to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. And then it's just a process of like, did it work? Yes or no? And then trying something else again, over and over and over again. Yeah, it's just the nature of the, the platform. And I mean, in the six years since you and I have been doing this, the type of video that YouTube favors and lets kind of like lead the charge of what YouTube is, that's changed like three or four times. Yeah. Definitely. I remember the good old days when you could make a 45 second viral cartoon and <laughs> pay off a car. <laughs> but uh, those days, those days are gone. Yeah, yeah, long gone. Do you guys think it's a good or bad idea right now to become a YouTube gamer, given the current state of YouTube with demonetization, etc.? <laughs> Um, I, I wonder if gamer is specifically it, or even just a creator in general on YouTube. Well, I but feel like they ask specifically about being a YouTube gamer. Right. <laughs> That's a loaded question, though, because it's what you're asking is if it's financially viable, yeah. not whether or not you should do it. If you want to do it, you should do it. And have a good time and have fun and build an audience if that's what you want to do. It, I, I feel like it's a little more difficult for smaller channels right now than it used to be um, to grow. Uh, but if it's really what you really want to do, then fucking go for it, man. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, do it, do it, do anything. Don't do anything that you don't love. Because if, if you don't love doing it, you won't have the, the energy and drive to do it all the time, every day, nonstop for years. You know, which is what you have to do to get anything going, really. I, I mean, even even before I ever joined Game Grumps, uh, when I was still working in Maker, I would hear them have like internal conversations, and they would say things like, "YouTube is not YouTube is not a way to make money. YouTube is an advertising platform that you then use to drive an audience to something else, which you which allows you to sustain yourself economically, you know, and and that's what a lot of people do through merchandise and um, a million other projects and stuff, but it's still, I don't know a better alternative, you know, to, to building an audience and putting yourself out there and getting stuff done. It's really fun. It's never stopped being fun. I mean, you'll get burnt out probably, but who cares? You get burnt out working anywhere. So yeah, do it because you love it. I, I highly recommend doing something because you enjoy doing it. Um, not because you think it's going to bring you fame or money or, or it's going to get you to the top or, or whatever fucking weird reason. All you got to think of is the straight line to happiness. Do you enjoy doing this? And then it can get more complicated in that like, okay, well, I enjoy drawing sometimes, right? And then other times I don't enjoy drawing. 
but is it worth it to stick it out for the times that I don't enjoy it so that I get better for the times that I do enjoy it? And in that circumstance, I would say, yeah. Drawing is an extension of yourself, and when you do a drawing that you don't like, you hate yourself. You don't hate the drawing. I mean, you say you do, but what do you really feel? Just do shit because you like it, man. That's, that's, uh, that's how I feel. That's how I feel.